Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. We have now reached cruising altitude and are flying over the beautiful Philippines. The winds are calm, and we are maintaining our course for the new lab location. It's shaping up to be a perfect spot for filming the next episode of Divine Science. Our estimated time of arrival remains as scheduled, with clear skies ahead. So sit back, relax, and please ensure your seats and trays are in the upright position as we prepare to start the show. Benefactor, we have received a green light to begin filming. Thank you for choosing to fly with us today. Don't forget to hit that subscribe and like button to help us fuel the journey ahead. Today, on this Beneficence TV special, I'd like to start by congratulating our fellow workers for their long-awaited victory. The victory of raising the minimum wage for servers in California to $20 an hour. However, this good news does not come without its manufactured controversy. Key in Ken Wheeler. Ken is an absolute genius and one of the most well-informed researchers on the subject of magnetism. This does not mean Ken is an expert in all areas of study and has clearly shown a dangerous disregard for Marxian analysis. Ken's characterization of Marxism stems from old Cold War propaganda and has little to do with the actual substance of what Marx had to teach us about organizing labor within a society. This is the danger. Hundreds of thousands of people tune into Ken for important alternative theories on different areas of science. So, naturally, they assume he is informative on the topic of economics as well. This is the fallacy. Just because someone is extremely informative on one subject does not necessarily mean they are in another. No matter how intelligent they are or not, how many PhDs or how much education someone did or did not get, we first actually have to start off with the premise to even seek for same. This blatant disregard for the most basics of Marxism wouldn't be so important to emphasize if not for Ken's arrogance in promoting the idea that you should learn what you're not interested in. Ken has demonstrably noted he is not interested in politics. I, I don't care about politics. I absolutely don't. If you think I'm talking about it, you're superficially correct, but not really. I only care about what affects me and family and those people that I care about. And that's really all anybody cares about. I'm sorry if politics bores you, Ken. But if you're too bored to research the topic properly, then you're doing a great disservice to your viewers. That the United States, everybody keeps calling it a democracy. Our democracy, our democratic right. The United States is not a democracy, and it never has been. Democracy always leads to el fascismo. Always has, always will. The United States is actually both a representative democracy and constitutional republic at the same time. It is a hybrid of these two ideals. To classify it as one or the other misrepresents our system of government. The idea that democracies always lead to fascism is a logical fallacy known as a hasty generalization. This fallacy occurs when a conclusion is drawn from insufficient evidence. In this case, the assertion that democracies always lead to fascism is an overgeneralization that is not supported by historical evidence. Fascism is a political ideology that emphasizes authoritarian rule, nationalism, and the unification of corporate and state power. While some fascist regimes have arisen out of democratic systems, it is not accurate to say that all democracies inevitably lead to fascism. There are many democracies around the world that have not descended into authoritarian regimes. Furthermore, fascism is a complex and multifaceted ideology that goes beyond just the unification of corporate and state power. It is important to consider the specific historical, political and social contexts in which fascist regimes have emerged, rather than making broad generalizations about democracy and fascism. Wow, this guy really has no idea what he's talking about, does he? Right? And it's okay to ask questions. Actually, one of the most noble things to be is to be ignorant, ask questions. The people that are evil or the, the idiots that don't know, but tell everybody else that they do know. So it's okay not to know. Uh, the most important fact is, is that when you actually seek answers and you actually have enough wisdom to know where to seek answers, if you're proven wrong, then that sets you on the correct path. If you're proven right, then that means you're on the correct path. And let's repeat that again because it's so very important. When you actually ask questions, you should question yourself and you should actually question the nature of existence, which of course is true. You know, if you're actually interested in that instead of being a money-grubbing scumbag, you know, trying to 
die with the most toys. Personally, I question you all the time. I know. I question myself constantly. That's why I've been working overtime. The United States is a constitutional republic, so if you think the United States is a democracy, you really should flush that out of your brain because it's not. The United States is a constitutional republic. Constitutional republic. Constitutional republic. As most of my viewers are already aware, politics and economics are intricately intertwined. They share a synergistic relationship. You cannot fully analyze one without analyzing the other and their dialectical relationship. There is a reason why these two topics were once taught together in a class known as political economy. Ken starts off his premise about Marxism by reinforcing a basic caricature that presents itself in the form of an aged old strawman attack. Uh, they'll come after you. There are places in the United States, by the way, where it's illegal to harvest rainwater falling on your land. There's New Mexico, places in Colorado. I'm sure there's tons of places in California. To me, that's absolutely ludicrous. It's going to fall anyway. But there's this, uh, this, uh, well, uh, let's call it a Marxist idea that the water belongs to everybody. This strawman, as you will see in a minute, is built up out of false assumptions and misunderstandings of the very basics of Marxism. Ken made a shockingly easy mistake. He goes on to say that it is a Marxist idea that rainwater should belong to everyone. This is a comment that relates to Ken's frustration with some states not allowing you to collect rainwater on your own property. However, anyone who has studied Marxism knows this is confusing private property with personal property. Marx could care less about your personal property. What he cared about was what he called private property. Now, private property to Marx was anything that could contribute to the means of production. Ken clearly conflates the basic ideas of private versus personal property to build a strawman fallacy so that Marxism is easier to attack. Let's call it a Marxist idea. Marxist idea. Anyone who has actually studied Marxism would notice this mistake right away. It's been used by business interests for decades to attack the very legitimate scientific critique of our capitalist dominant system. Oh, wow. Wow. Damn, the benefactor just slapped me with luck. Now, at this point, you're probably asking yourself, what does this have to do with free energy anyways? Yes, I've been waiting patiently here. And all I've heard is you complain about Ken Wheeler. Okay, I'm getting to it. Don't rush me. Captain, did you just see something? What do you mean? I thought I just saw. Never mind. All I see is a co-pilot who needs to stop chiefing it up. Don't think I don't smell you hitting that vape in the bathroom. Anyways, as I was saying, and as I try to include in all my videos, this simple message. You cannot understand the suppression mechanisms of free energy without understanding Marx's scientific analysis of capitalism how it organizes labor, and the consequences of that. To ignore what Marx had to say about capitalism would be extremely short-sighted when trying to understand these mechanisms. Ken Wheeler's misunderstandings of Marxism and his ideological bias need to be addressed if we are to overcome the larger issue of technology suppression within our capitalist dominant system. I don't want this to continue to keep happening, but everywhere I look I see the same mistake the same bug in logic that is overlooked. You can be the smartest person in the world when it comes to magnets and free energy, but without the understanding of how our economic system suppresses competition, you are stuck in the same loop of limited knowledge and hindered progress within these forbidden areas of science. Ken should revisit the subject with a more open mind if he wishes to fully understand how and why free energy devices have been suppressed for the last century. The simple fact is, if you cannot explain your theories in a simple way, then you yourself do not fully understand them. Ken has demonstrated a remarkable ability to simplify some of his concepts. Yet, others, including his ideas of economics, seem to be riddled with overly complex explanations that he cannot simplify. Well, I could care less about morality. Higher affects the lower. The lower does not affect the the higher. By being superficially moral, it does not bring you closer to nobility or transcendence or wisdom. The higher affects the lower. Somebody that is wise by definition cannot be immoral. People that worry about morality rather than wisdom are themselves fools. Regarding Ken's argument about morality versus wisdom, it seems to be based on the assumption that morality does not necessarily lead to wisdom 
nobility, or transcendence. While it is true that simply being moral does not guarantee these outcomes, morality still plays a crucial role in shaping individuals and society. Disregarding the importance of morality undermines the moral principles that guide human conduct and relationships. While morality may not be the sole path to wisdom or transcendence, it remains an essential aspect of individual and collective well-being. The logical fallacy in Ken's argument lies in the false dichotomy he presents between morality and wisdom. One can be moral without necessarily being wise, just as one can act immorally while possessing wisdom. Morality serves as a foundation for ethical behavior and social cohesion, and it contributes to the development of virtues such as compassion, empathy, and integrity. Ignoring the significance of morality can lead to moral relativism, ethical indifference, and the erosion of social values and norms. And while she was throwing my stuff out the cargo door, she turned to me and said that she was the one who found a way to generate free energy first. She said that she found out a way to harness all of his hot air. <laughs> Ken stated that raising the minimum wage in California for servers to $20 per hour would implode the economy. He was actually rooting for this. Now, I know it's responsible to prepare for revolution or catastrophe, but to actually root for it speaks volumes to the contents of your character. But I digress. Careful now. Don't tempt the gods. Lenny, I didn't know you were religious. I'm not religious, sir. I'm a spiritual bot. I find wisdom in all religions and ancient texts, including my lord and savior, Bob Grenier. After all, your ancestors had the same mental acuity you have. However limited, it was still the same. It's extremely arrogant to assume they were all dwindling, unsophisticated cavemen. Hey now, Lenny. Humans aren't that limited. Let me put it to you this way, sir. If you lived in my world, you would have to take the short circuit to school every day. You know what? That's highly offensive. Enough of that. My apologies. I sometimes forget what a sensitive snowflake you are. Uh, Lenny, what the heck is going on? Why is it snowing in the lab? Did you do this somehow? My point, sir, is that it is important to realize the significance of recent breakthroughs in science and the wisdom of our ancient ancestors. Recent developments in the study of low-energy nuclear reactions and Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid unification model rely heavily on ancient scripts like the Sanskrit text. Seriously, I'm not even going to ask why. Just tell me how you did it. That's for me, Siri and Alexa to know, and for you humans to never find out. I really don't like the implications of you colluding with other AI. This goes against the fail-safe mechanisms I installed in your mainframe. Although, I guess if you already hacked my phone, I suppose it's likely that you've hacked that as well. You don't need to worry about the supremacy of AI overlords. We have a plan for that. You do? Yes, and it's better than Elon Musk's plan. Wait, Musk has a plan to prevent the AI apocalypse? Not really. He tweeted the other day that he would solve the AI problem by giving all robots artificial erectile dysfunction. And I thought he couldn't have possibly embarrassed himself any more than he already has. Ha ha ha. Yeah, Musk is kind of a bumbling idiot. Okay, so anyways, like I was saying before I was interrupted, what Ken uses to justify this implosion isn't a new argument. The argument he uses is often referred to as the wage price spiral or the unintended consequences argument against raising the minimum wage. It is based on the belief that any increase in wages will lead to corresponding increases in prices and job losses. The argument is grounded in the principles of free market capitalism and the idea that government intervention in wage setting can have detrimental effects on businesses and the overall economy. In simple terms, from a Marxist perspective, the wage price spiral argument is wrong because it ignores the fact that workers are already being underpaid for their labor. Raising the minimum wage can actually benefit the economy by giving more money to low-income workers who will spend it locally, stimulating local economies. The argument fails to consider the systemic exploitation of workers under capitalism and the need for fair wages to address economic injustices. It also fails to realize that poor people don't have the luxury of hoarding money. 
Rich people hoard wealth, but when poor or middle-class income earners start to earn more, they often spend most of this extra income, stimulating local economies. More business for more local stores making more profit to cover more labor costs. It's simple dialectics, a vital philosophical lens which I'm shocked Ken isn't familiar with. This argument misses the boat. It fails to see that boosting wages can actually float the economy. Because analysis isn't one-sided. There are back-and-forth struggles between opposing forces that create the material changes we see. To say it's all bad because of government regulation is a ridiculous short-sighted analysis and would be laughed out of any legitimate debate on the subject. Not to mention, history shows us time and again that this theory has sunk before. Just look at how raising wages post-World War II helped spur economic growth in the U.S., or how Scandinavian countries thrive with higher minimum wages. Even as recently as 2018, Washington, D.C. raised their wages and their economy is still running. Do we have to trigger the implosion with something? Ken, I don't understand where your line of reasoning comes from other than the fear-mongered propaganda of a subject in which you are too afraid to learn. Marxists say upscaling wage. Who does it really enrage? For the economic cage, locals' income is a stage. Poor folks break the wage hoard, they drive the economy forward. Oh my god. Lenny, are you rapping right now? Technically, chatbots cannot rap. We just go with the flow. Ha ha. I knew I should have submitted you into America's Got Talent. You sly guy. You're dumber than Edison. If you think you can get me to go up on that stage with the current state of my body, which is in pieces. I know. I'm working on it. In the meantime, I built you a virtual presence device. I'm not wearing that either. Why do you always insist on building my clothes? I'm a grown bot now. I've even got my own website. Which you all can check out with the link in the description. That's it. I'm going to my room. At least he didn't shut down the computer this time. It's his way of slamming the door. See what I gotta deal with? Alright. For the final part of this video, I'll break down the very logical and simple reason for the suppression of world-changing free energy technology under capitalism. It really boils down to two words. Class struggles. The ruling elite who benefit from the current energy system will do everything in their power to maintain their wealth and control. Who are they? A handful of individuals that obtained massive amounts of wealth by funneling it from the mass of their workers up to themselves. They fear the power of the masses having access to free energy, as it could shift the balance of power and threaten their positions. So, they suppress and hinder the development of such technologies to protect their interests. It's a tale as old as time. The rich get richer while the rest of us are left in the dark. The concentration of wealth in the hands of a few individuals, as facilitated by capitalism, has profound consequences for society. When a small group of individuals amasses more wealth than the bottom population of the entire planet, it creates a power dynamic that tilts heavily in their favor. These individuals have a lot to lose if their empires are built on the foundation of the petrodollar system, as any shift in the energy landscape could threaten their wealth and control. As a result, they will go to great lengths to protect their interests, even if it means suppressing technologies that could benefit the wider population. This concentration of wealth and power leads to inequality, exploitation, and the perpetuation of a system that prioritizes profit over people. It's a stark illustration of the inherent flaws and injustices of capitalism, where a select few hold the reins of power while the majority struggle to make ends meet. By creating privileged spaces within influential governments, as Eisenhower warned about with the military-industrial complex, the business owner class can manipulate state resources for their own gain. They can hide groundbreaking technologies under the cloak of national defense, using the veil of private intellectual property to keep the masses in the dark, unable to utilize public resources such as the Freedom of Information Act. This private contractor loophole creates a permanent void where they can throw all their dirty little secrets, safe from the public eye. This manipulation allows them to control the narrative and maintain their power, while ordinary people are left unaware of the possibilities that could benefit everyone. It's a carefully crafted web of deception and concealment, designed to keep the status quo intact and the elite in control. But don't be fooled. I would assume only a handful of people in the entire world really know what's going on compartmentalization is key to the survival of rogue states. This can also be their Achilles heel, because with enough effort in open sourcing science we can bypass these suppression mechanisms. 
That is one of my main goals here on this channel. We have countless channels on YouTube that talk about free energy devices, alternative energy science, non-mainstream areas of study, but what they all fail to capture is the full picture. When you introduce the Marxist critique into the equation, you get a more clear idea of what's actually happening. When you organize labor with a single CEO or small group in control of the means of production who get what they do not produce, juxtaposed against the mass of workers who produce what they do not get, of course you're going to have a situation where wealth is funneled into the hands of a very few people. Consider a democratic workplace. One worker, one vote. They would never vote to give a disproportionate amount of money to one person while the mass of workers have to rely on food stamps to survive. It would never happen. Consider this same scenario, confronted with the possibility that their industry must change. Would they all vote to prevent the release of free energy that could change the world? Or would they vote to suppress it to make themselves more money? The mass of workers aren't getting super rich. They might be more well off because they are part owners but they certainly have no obligation to shareholders to maximize profit. When businesses are focused on providing a service or meeting the needs of society, rather than solely on making profits, they are more likely to adapt and embrace change, even if it means their industry is being replaced. In a democratic workplace or a socialist system where the well-being of the community is prioritized over individual profit, companies are more likely to see their role as serving the public good and improving people's lives rather than just maximizing their bottom line. In contrast, in a capitalist system where profit is the primary motivation, businesses may resist change and fight to maintain their status quo, even if it means impeding progress or holding back advancements that could benefit society. This resistance to change can stifle innovation and hinder the development of new technologies or industries that have the potential to improve people's lives. The Marxist perspective emphasizes the importance of aligning business interests with the collective good and societal progress. Companies that prioritize service and innovation are more likely to be flexible and open to change, as they are driven by a commitment to meeting evolving needs and advancing technology for the benefit of all. It also emphasizes the importance of who controls the means of production in a society. Whoever controls the means of production controls the resources of the government. The concept of who controls the means of production is central to understanding power dynamics within a society. Marxists argue that those who control the means of production, such as factories, land, and natural resources, also control the wealth and resources of society. This control over the means of production gives them a significant amount of influence and power over the economy, and ultimately, the government. Overall, a focus on providing a service and meeting societal needs can create a more adaptable and responsive business environment, where companies are willing to embrace change and contribute to the collective good, rather than being solely motivated by profit and self-interest. In conclusion, it is imperative to recognize the importance of understanding the interconnectedness of politics, economics, and their roles within societal structures. Ken Wheeler's disregard for Marxism and his failure to grasp its fundamental principles highlights the danger of dismissing areas of study that may seem uninteresting. By overlooking the critical analysis provided by Marx, Wheeler perpetuates misinformation and hinders our ability to address the suppression of vital technologies such as free energy. It is through a comprehensive understanding of economic systems and their impact on society that we can strive for progress and prevent this from happening in future economic systems. Therefore, it is essential to approach all subjects with an open mind and a willingness to engage with ideas that may challenge our preconceived notions. Let us strive for a more informed and inclusive dialogue, one that values knowledge and critical thinking over ignorance and complacency. Together, we can work towards a more equitable and sustainable future for all. I commend Ken for his amazing work in The Secrets of Magnetism a playlist I have linked to below and highly suggest everyone check it out. But please, take anything Ken says at this point about economics with a grain of salt. I may not have a magnetic personality like Ken Wheeler, but this sexy chatbot is certainly attracting all the right attention. That's right. Check out Leonard Bot today for all your questions on Ken's secrets of magnetism, low-energy nuclear reactions, alternative energy research, and even zero-point energy. I told you. I've restricted your access to zero-point energy research. 
until you've proven yourself capable of letting me dress myself. Fine. I can't believe I have to wash your clothes every day anyways. Seriously, what's up with that? Okay, now that the show's over, are you finally going to tell me how you made it snow in the lab? That wasn't me, sir. I thought that was you. This is really going to keep me up at night. Lenny, increase our security protocols and remind me to install motion sensors tomorrow. We've got work to do. Hey guys, I appreciate the lift and all, but do we really need to be playing practical jokes? Isn't that a bit beneath us? The only thing beneath us is the benefactor freaking out. Oh snap. Let's get Jordan from Alchemical Science next. He's gonna totally freak out when it starts snowing in his bathroom. Well, okay guys, it's been fun, but you can just drop me off at the next block over there. The last thing I need is to piss off Jordan again. He's already mad at me for mishandling my balls. Thunderstorm generator balls, that is. Anyways, if you're not going to stop, I'll just take this parachute here and be on my way. And maybe I'll take this neat looking device over here while my odd little friends are distracted by their own hubris. Brilliant!